was in Colombia for about uh, a week or so, and now before I start, I want to thank the ambassador for sticking around to to view this presentation. Hopefully, it's worth your worth your stay. Um, so yeah, it, it was pretty much uh, a hectic week for me. Um, usually, these series will take around um, two weeks or so with two persons, but this one was sort of crammed into one week. So it was a week of about 20 meetings and a bunch of store checks, about 19 or so that I counted when I was reviewing the pictures. I'm just going to cover some of the, the highlights of the research that I, that I did, some things that I think would be interesting to you guys. It's by no means all the information that we have. So at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you an idea of all the other information that we have. So if there's something that doesn't really touch you specifically, because I, I was reviewing the registration list and there's a, a wide array of, of different products. So if something doesn't touch you specifically, um, we can treat with it. Because the important things about this, this type of activity is not necessarily gathering the static information, but making the necessary contacts in the market where you can always get additional information and new information as it pops up, because things change over time. So I'm going to start with a point raised by the ambassador earlier. 50 million people, 49.1 well, in 2017, right? It's a lot of people, and it could be daunting to, to some companies trying to enter a market and you're thinking automatically, do I have the capacity or how am I going to reach all these people? Now, this 50 million people, they're not a homogeneous bunch of people that all look the same and all demand the same products or all located in the same area. They're split into different things. So, Ambassador raised uh, the cities. So, at the left panel, panel there, you see the top 10 cities and all are padded to grow. This chart actually shows uh, demographics on the movement of demographics from 2015 to 2030. So, it actually shows how things are moving. So, there are a number of cities that could be targeted. Bogota has about 10 million people. There are some coastal cities that have over 1 million. There's Cartagena, Barranquilla, Santa Marta, that all have a million persons. Santa Marta, I think, is 500,000 that could be targeted. So if capacity is a concern for you, you can limit your entry into one of those cities to start with and then move on after. There's also difference in ethnicity. Now, most of the, the Colombians are considered mestizos, so they look kind of uh, a mixture between uh, the, the Indians, the local Indians, as well as whites. But, sorry? Indigenous. Indigenous. <laughs> That's what I'm yeah, Not Indian like me. Indigenous <laughs> Indians. Um, <laughs> so, there's also Afro-Colombians. Right? So, on the chart, there's about 20-22% Afro-Colombians. When I met with the ambassador, I'm, I'm happy he mentioned the cosmetics. Uh, Spoken with Sasha Cosmetics, if you didn't get that hint. And, um, <laughs> yeah, she mentioned color, you know, and that there are many Colombians that uh, she needs darker and Afro Colombian. And the, the, the Sasha Cosmetics is designed for, you know, different shades of women uh, that is appealing to them. So that is, that is something to look at as well. Colombia also has an a aging population. If you look um, at the line chart below there, the age group of 30, 35 or so to the life expectancy of the, the average Colombia that was 79 is expected, is expected to grow by 2030. And in converse, you can see the population, the younger population, they are actually expected to fall in 2050. So there are some changes that are happening as well that could be considered. But main point here is to show that it's not 50 million of the same, but it could be distributed by location, by ethnicity, by age, etc. Right? Um, Back in 2013, this is not the first time we've been to Colombia. We've been there back in 2013 with, with Natalie and Demi, who is now at Caribbean Exports. Um, and that was a much more extensive trip. But one of the main things that we discovered in that trip that we didn't know of before was this social class structure and structure that exists in Colombia. Um, there are six classes, but here only five is covered. So you see um, 
class A is the highest, and class E would be the lowest class. The lowest class has the most people, about 16 million people. Right, and most of those persons, they were sort of displayed with the um, past armed conflicts that existed in Colombia. The fastest growing class, however, is class C, which is the middle class. And there are a number of companies like Juan Valdez who are able to capitalize on that middle class by offering uh, spe specialized products and having in their stores a sort of ambience that these sort of middle class people will appreciate. So it's a company being flexible. And that is something that you have to be in Colombia. You need to adjust to your market and adjust to your consumers. And that's what, what Juan Valdez was able to do. And they uh, see the profits from that. Right? Um, Ambassador also spoke about the different departments and different cities in Colombia. And the point here is just to make that these different cities, they have different levels of consumption expenditure. So Bogota, you find, is above the national average, but there are some other cities that are not lagging too far behind. So there, there is the ability to purchase there. Right, so these are the cities that I, I, I visited during my stay, Bogota, Barranquilla, and Cartagena. So I spent about three days in Bogota, left Wednesday night to Barranquilla, and then drove across Thursday night to Cartagena, spent Friday and Saturday, and then got back on Sunday. That was, that was, that was the schedule, right? And these cities are, are, are very different. So Bogota is, is, is cold, it's up in the mountains. All right, it's, it's much more populous. When you go down to Barranquilla and Cartagena, you'll find this to the coast is much more Caribbean, laid back. Um, my, the consultant I was working with, he, were, he couldn't talk enough about how laid back people from Barranquilla And you know, he's looking at himself having to go eight to four and these guys lying in bars and in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. They are um, Caribbean people. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, so yeah, there's a difference there, and um, I mean, sometimes I, I think the weather could affect personality. <laughs> so the ambassadors are green. So when it's cold, you know, you sort of depressed sometimes. I have, I have some friends who live in Toronto as well. When it's the weather is cold, there they, they like a, a different person to when they come down here when you need them there. So that has something to do with it, I guess. Um, but. Generally, you find that the people on the coast were a bit more welcoming. When I looked at the meetings that I got um, in Bogota, I didn't meet with the top guys, the top level executives, but on the coast, you were able to, 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 to meet with the top, the owners of companies and stuff like that. They were willing to make themselves available to you. So that's, that, that's just some differences between these cities. And I know the ambassador being from Carter, you know, you can share some more differences. No, right, so just want to make this point about language and meetings because the official language of Colombia is Spanish. Um, I know in some Spanish speaking countries there's a lot of English spoken, so you could get away with not knowing a lot of Spanish. M most of the business meetings I had, people did speak some degree of Spanish, but they preferred, sorry, English, but they preferred to carry on the meeting in Spanish, right? Um, so definitely, I think that an interpreter is necessary for the market. Even if the meeting is going to be conducted in Spanish, to get into the meeting itself, to finalize the schedule if something changes, and there's a lot of security at these buildings, right? So you need to speak with the front desk. Front desk needs to check with the person to make sure you have the meeting. You need to sign in. You need to get a card. If you have any electronic devices, you need to tag those or writing serial numbers and stuff like that. So it's definitely um, helpful to have someone who speaks the language if, if you aren't able to, to get you around like that. Right? Um, some other security issues, well not issues per se, but it's something to note that you would see sometimes um, soldiers around different corners just for security purposes. So it's not that something is going down, it's just to keep things safe. Um, even when you go into car parks and in, in, in malls, you have like the dogs that would sniff, they'll check on the car with mirrors and stuff like that, just to make sure that things are safe. Right, this, this is a, a picture of the, uh, the ministry building, and 
it's just to show you how serious they take security. Like in 2013, I tried to take a, a picture of this building and the security chased me here. Oh yeah, I was like, no, you can't do that. And then I came back this year and I, I did the same thing. <laughs> but I got away, I got away this time. Right, um, so I talk uh, about the depreciation of exchange rates. Because like China and Tobago, Colombia is a, a resource-rich country and they too are affected by the changes in oil prices. But we have a managed flows and, and they don't. So although we were able to keep our exchange rate at a certain level, despite the issues that we have with the availability of it, they went a different route and allowed it to dep depreciate. So there was a depreciation in the exchange rate. Um, so in 2015, it moved from about 2,000 to one US dollar to about 3,000 per US dollar. So a, a big change there. That would have affected their trade balance because imports would have now been made more expensive and their exports would now be cheaper to um, would be importers of the product, which in the end affects the country positively. Right, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the retail landscape here. And when I'm talking about retail landscape, it's mostly uh, fast moving consumer goods. We're talking about supermarkets um, and that sort of thing. Right, so these are the major players in the, in the grocery retail um, landscape. So Casino Gishad, um, and they are the owners of Exito. And there's a, a, a number of permutations of Exito here. Yeah, you have Exito Almacenes. Um, I still express Korea, Korea is a high end, Surti Max is a low end, and then you have Inter, the Epona. So they cater to all aspects, all, all the different classes that I mentioned. Right? Um, then you have Super Tiendas e Drogarias uh, Olympica. Uh, they have two major brands, Olympica and Sao. This, this company is actually based in uh, Barakia. But a very um, um, wealthy and influential, influential family. Well, the uh, the Charles, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Metro and Jumbo. And <coughs> no, the real the real interesting guys in this landscape are these neighborhood convenience stores who have been punching way above their weight class. So, do do you know? Um, from Cuba and Ara from Geronimo Martins and then there's Custo y Bueno from Mercaderia. So these guys actually set up in different neighborhoods. If you can't drive like two minutes without seeing a, one of them, a D1 or a Ara. And they offer convenience and price. So you could walk to your corner and then you can enter the one or whatever and they offer much lower prices than you get at the supermarket. They, a lot of them have their own brands, so they're investing a lot in private label. And you could only get those brands in those stores. Right, so further on, I'll, I'll go through some, of the more, some more details with these stores. Um, there's also Alcosto, which is similar to Pricemart, which is a sort of membership shopping. And I covered uh, Solima Corona's uh, home center store which is a, that's a huge store, a huge uh, chain in Latin America and it covers most of uh, South America. Right, so these are some of the convenience stores here. So that's, that's Ara, um, Justo y Bueno, and De Uno. Uh, this is the home center storefront there. So I wanna show you the difference between Ara, this is what Ara looks like, very nice inside. You know, they have a certain standard there's a minimum floor space, there must be a, a bakery at the store, um, they have a certain number of cashers, so there's pretty much a standard there. And then there's the Uno, and they just about a space and selling product as cheaply as possible. They probably have two cashers at most. So they more about get, getting sales done as cheaply as possible. They don't really care about the ambience and how things look and experience and stuff like that. So it's two different models. There are a lot more they will than ours though, and you can probably understand why. Any available space, they just buy it up and it's a store. 
right? And these are some of the bigger chains. So Olympica that I mentioned before, Exito, that is an express store, is now one of the big department stores that they have. And that's Jumbo, that's one of their more branches in uh, Barranquilla. Right, so the proliferation of private labels. Now usually when we go on these um, uh, market series, there's a lot of discussion about brands and stuff like that. This, and, and last time we were there in 2018, uh, that's how the discussion went down and private labels were now coming in. This time, most of the conversation was just about private labels. They, didn't, they weren't too interested in anything else. All right, so of the seven buyers I met with, three big, three medium, one small, all preferred private labels, right, to national brands. And everybody is getting it in the bandwagon. So it's not just retailers. We're talking about the distributors. We're talking about agents. Anybody who comes into contact with the trade, they want their own private label. Right? And there are certain advantages of having a private label. One is, you know, you can keep a lot of the margin because there's no middleman, there's no wholesaler, retailer. You just buy it directly from the supplier, so all that margin becomes yours. And you also have control of a product. Now, you don't manufacture anything, um, but you can have control over um, how a product is formulated, how it is packaged, the brand to be used, and all that information, you, all that um, characteristics, you will have control of it being a private label owner. So you can see the advantages of, of going into private label. Also important to note is that um, there's the store brand private label, so you see Exito has their store brand and they also have another one called Econo, which is the economy. So Exito brand will be the value brand and Econo is actually the economy brand. And I guess that's why it's in the name. Um, but some retailers are creating different brands for different products. So you're not going to walk into Ara and see an Ara brand across everything. It's still private label, but it's different brands for different products. So if you go to Exito, you're going to see the Exito and the Econo brands slapped on everything across every category. We're not going to see that in like an Ara deal. All right, and what is important to these importance of, importance of private label brands? Well, firstly, there's the price. You have to be competitive. They already have suppliers in place, so you need to bring a price that's better to sort of make them interested in switching and having a conversation with you. Your ability to modify a product and formulation and the packaging as well. That, that is an important one because I think last time we were there in 2013, we brought information back about changes that were necessary in the markets and sometimes, you know, exporters, I know there's some cost involved and it could interrupt your production, but some of, some of these things you have to be willing to change in order to be able to do business in the market. So sometimes you have to be a bit flexible in terms of your product formulation and how you package your product and offer it for the market. Because it might be fine for trans and and CARICOM, but not so much Latin America. So being open to those changes is important. Consistent quality over time. So not just if it's two shipments, but that that quality needs to be replicated over shipments um, to come in the future. The ability to share product formulations. Now, that may be an issue for some of our exporters, um, but they need to see what the formulation is, and they also need to test it in the market to make sure that it's what the consumers want, or it fits the profile that they have in, in mind. So. In most cases, they work with you in order to get the, pro the formulation right. They will do the market testing for you, sampling, give you that feedback, and then work with you to change the formulation as needs be. All right, our web packaging is a major input. The high volumes are necessary because you're going to be investing in this new packaging. Um, you need to do some high volumes with, with, with those or have the commitment to do high volumes with, with those because you're going to spend a lot of time developing that packaging to start with. So it doesn't make sense you do like a small batch and change up your packaging and then you know you don't see the returns in the end. So th those are just some of the things. If you decide to go the private label route, I think 
there's a lot to be discussed in order to reach that, that agreement and that understanding. Uh, this is a general process of, 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 of becoming a private label supplier that I piece together from my meetings. So first, they'd want to see the ingredient list uh, with the nutritional values, um, the sizes, quantities, and cases, and uh, how many cases could fit in a container, a 20 foot or a 40 foot, and then your production capacity. Right, so once you provide that information to them, they will make a decision, probably have some conversations with you, um, give you some feedback on if formulations need to change, testing can be done in the market. Um, they can use your existing product to do the testing and then give you that feedback and then you can make modifications for the private label after. Um, so Ara and Michael, Ara, well, those are the retailing chain from Geronimo Martins that I mentioned before. And Michael, those, they are a manufacturer slash distributor based in Barranquilla. I think they, they are like the 40th largest company in Colombia. Right, and then you finalize the details. So you finalize the formulation with the feedback provided, finalize the packaging designs and branding, branding and logos, and then you finalize the prices and orders. Now this is just general, right? When you really start your discussions, and you can get into some of the specifics, but just to give you an idea of what it would involve. Now margins. Um, I, I mentioned um, the, the margins for the private label before, as there's no middleman, so you'd expect a higher margin. So like Senko Sud, they set about 40%, up to 40%, because I guess they sum their distributor and uh, their retailer margins. Um, that's if the retailer is buying directly from you, the supplier. Now, it's also possible that a distributor picks up your product, because they also are interested in private label, and the margins that I got, the estimates are for food products 10 to 15%, and for personal care items, about 10 to 40%. And that's generally the sort of information you get, these kind of ranges that are sometimes wide. Right? So again, it will depend on the, the, the product that you're trying to export to the market, the person that you're selling to, and some other details that would, that would really de determine the, the margins. Right, and pricing, um, so I got this estimate from a commercial guide um, from US, US.gov, and they estimate that the final price is approximately 60 to 80% over the FOB price. And you have the components here on top. Right, so 20% of the FOB price for freight and insurance, warehousing and other documentation costs, is 19% VAT in Colombia. So it's, it's relatively high. Um, and the import tariff, if the product is not duty free, and 30 to 40% profit. So that's basically the breakdown of the price, which amounts to about 60 to 80% over the FOB price. All right, so we're gonna get deeper into these private labels here now. So here we have on the left, Exitos Value Brand, which is you know, Exito brand, and then you have the economy brand, which is Econo. So these are for, this is toilet paper, and these are napkins. This is the street brands. But now, this is Olympica's um, private label, Aqua Mass. That's for water. So I think it's how much? 600 milliliters for each of the bottles. All right? So look, look at the difference in prices here. These are the two waters, Mananchel and um, Brisa. Those are like standard waters in the market. Like I, I drank these waters and it, it's, it's common, right? In the market, you see them in all these stores. But there's this store brand here, Agua Mas, that sells for, is like half the cost of the Brisa and almost a third the cost of the Mananchel. So that's the sort of prices private label could go down to. Um, and that's just one, one instance. Now, well, how well these private labels are, are received, it's, it's kind of, it, it kind of differs. There are some established brands, like say like Exito now has been around for some time, it's established. But some of these Olympica brands, so Olympica has a, another private label called uh, Gold Metal. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's a different brand. And here, 
they have olive oil in a, in a plastic bottle. It's a lot cheaper than the glass bottle of olive oil that you'll be accustomed to. And the store manager here, the guy, the guy in the pink, my, my good friend, he's trying to sell these, these old gentlemen the, uh, the olive oil in the, in the plastic bottle when their wives clearly told them that they need to get a specific brand. So he, he was having a, a sort of hard time. I, I think he eventually sold them, but I think they would have had to come back to the supermarket and change that. 